Hello class, um, today we're going to review over chapters 1 and 2 to prepare for the test that will be uh, tomorrow or Wednesday, uh, September 18th. So I'm going to go through the daily questions and kind of review through those from both sets of chapters uh, so that you can study for all of the information that we've covered. So the first thing here um, was August 28th we did lab safety and said describe five rules of the lab. You should be able to do that. I'm not going to go through all of the lab rules um, like tying your hair back, um, making sure you follow directions, all those things. Just be sure you look back over the rules of the lab. Sorry, get this going here. Okay, day two we went through um, scientific method, um, control setup, things like that. So we'll go through that here. Um, the order of the scientific method, you um, don't necessarily have to be able to write everything straight in order, um, but having the correct idea of how we plan the scientific method. So first you would have a problem, and then um, you would get some background information, and then you'd go through a hypothesis. And this hypothesis, a key part here, is making it an if-then statement. If I do this, then this will happen. If I give students caffeine in the morning, then they will perform better on their test. If I give students a piece of candy in the morning before their test, then they will perform better on the test. It's something measurable. It's telling me what I'm doing, and it's also a measurable tool. So we have problem, background information, hypothesis. Four is going to be the actual experiment. And we'll go through the parts of that here in a minute. Five um, would be data and analysis of that data. So you're going to get data tables, graphs, and then give a few statements about the uh, information about the data. Six could be a conclusion. And again, you have to refer back to your hypothesis and also back to your data for that. And then seven would be publish and let people know what you found. Okay, um, question two. Why is it important to have a control setup in every experiment? The control setup is your comparison. You take away the variable in the control setup and you compare your results to the control setup. If you don't have a control setup, it's not a valuable um, experiment, and um, you don't know if the results actually are working or if the data is actually uh, good data. So setting up a valid experiment, um, we're going to show that down here. You should have a control and no variable in the control. Sorry, that looks like it's a different letter there. No variable. Um, you'll have an experimental group. And in that experimental group, you are going to have your independent variable. And that is the thing you change as the scientist. Um, so giving caffeine or giving a piece of candy. Okay, dependent variable is what you measure. So if I'm doing performance on a test, um, I would look at test scores. So again, independent variable, maybe I'm giving a piece of candy before the test. And dependent variable, I'm seeing um, if students perform better because they got the piece of candy. So in order to do that experiment, I would need a group that is not getting any candy at all. And that would be my control. So the group without candy is the control. As an example, this is gets candy. as my experimental, and then my dependent is going to be the test scores. Okay, um, There are also called standardized variables, and standardized variables are the things you keep the same for every group. So things like maybe what they ate or drank that morning, um, how much sleep they got, how much did they study, all of those things. So standardized variables um, remain the same for every group. And 
maybe um, my study is on sugar, so that's why I gave them candy, but um, I might give a group a placebo where it's actually sugarless candy and try and see if there's any difference there. So no candy versus sugar candy versus sugarless candy, and I could test that out. And so a placebo is a term that just means that you're giving them a fake um, of whatever your independent variable is. Okay, ways you can present your data, um, graphs, tables, charts, and you could do um, your lab presentation, things like that. Okay, so that was most of the information from Chapter 1. Okay, moving on to Chapter 2 and 3, we'll go over these daily questions. What is matter? Oh, sorry about that. Let me go back a slide here and get the pen. Matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. So some examples, um, pretty simple, you, a desk, things like that, but also air is an example. Um, number two, what are elements made of? atoms. And what are compounds made of? Molecules. Two types of mixtures. Oh, we should go back. Elements and compounds are both pure substances. You know, make sure you know that substance, if you see substance or pure substance, that means elements and compounds. Two types of mixtures, homogeneous and heterogeneous. So homogeneous, you can't tell it's a mixture. It's mixed evenly. And usually this would be something like Kool-Aid. When you mix up Kool-Aid, um, it tastes the same at the beginning as it does at the end. You have a huge pitcher of Kool-Aid. The top of the container should taste the same as the bottom of the container. Heterogeneous is mixed unevenly. And in this one, um, sometimes you have to shake the mixture before you can uh, drink it in order to have the full flavor. So something like orange juice, sometimes you might have to shake that or uh, any type of fruit juice. And so heterogeneous mixtures can be colloids or suspensions. And suspensions you have to shake before use. A lot of times medicines are suspensions. And um, with these, it'll settle to the um, it'll settle down to the bottom over time if it's sitting still. And so suspension, some examples might be um, orange juice with pulp, um, medicines, uh, muddy water was one we had in our notes. Okay, colloids separate light. An example would be fog smoke. Milk is actually in this as well. Um, and so the particles are large enough that you can see them. They don't settle to the bottom. They kind of are suspended. Um, but they, uh, when light goes through them, they don't actually allow light to travel through. And we did this in lab. Hopefully you can remember that. You guys used, uh, a lot of you used your cell phone flashlight and um, noticed that light did not travel through. So how can items in a mixture be separated? Um, by physical means. So three possibilities would be um, distillation, where you um, evaporate off the water and then you get the pure water um, when it cools and you have maybe your salt or your sugar in the other container. Um, chromatography was one. We did talked about filters as one as well. Okay, so look back over those. We I think we gave about five or six in class. Um, take a look at those examples in your notes. Um, the next part here: states of matter and energy changes. So the three states of matter: solid, liquid, gas and the motion of the particles. So these vibrate in place. The solids, liquids slide past each other, and gases bounce off the container. 
Remember, all particles are in motion, so even solids have heat. They still move. They're just vibrating next to each other. So motion of particles as um, they are heated, they increase in motion as they get heated. And how does it relate to thermal expansion? So thermal expansion is when those particles take up more space, they will actually expand. And we see this in buildings. We have um, expansion joints where we allow the building to expand and contract based on the temperature. Describe the changes of state processes. So these are things like melting, freezing, evaporation, condensation. Look back over those. Those are usually pretty familiar for everybody. Um, and look back over sublimation. That's from a solid straight to a gas. And deposition, which is the opposite of that, from a gas straight to a solid. Okay. Three ways heat is transferred, convection, conduction, and radiation. So you need to know what those are. Convection is um, the particles in motion. And we notice this with boiling. You guys should have seen that in the lab when you were heating the water. Conduction is by touch. And radiation is by light. Okay, take a look at all three of those, review back over them. And then properties of matter. So physical and chemical properties. Physical are observable and measurable. Chemical are um, the actual chemical composition. So usually these are things like flammable, reactive. How do they react? Okay, and so look back over that as well. We gave some examples in notes yesterday. Three examples of physical changes and three examples of chemical changes. We gave those in notes yesterday as well. Take a look back at those um, things like cutting um, your hair, um, coloring something, um, state of matter. States of matter are physical changes. Make sure you know that. It seems like everybody has that. We miss that a lot in that question. Chemical changes are that they have burned, they've reacted, they've rotted, something like that. Law of conservation of mass says we cannot create or destroy matter in a chemical reaction. Okay, and then density. Density is mass over volume, and we're going to do this in lab today, um, but be able to do this if it asked you a calculation or you looked at a graph. If you're looking at a graph of mass and volume, this line right here tells us density. And so the slope of this line is going to give us the density of that particular object. Okay, that is the review for chapters 1 through 3, Physical Science, and the test is Wednesday, um, September 18th.